Eli had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and they were, simply speaking, scoundrels. I'm sure you've read the account of their lives. They did not know God. That's what we read in the Hebrew text. Yet they were appointed as priests and they were serving in the temple. These two men were men of cloth. And they remind me especially that the robe, the ring, the collar, the ordination, the ministry, the church, does not make the man. A so-called man of God can inwardly be a godless hooligan. With the actions, of course, to prove it, especially when they are exposed. And we all know such people, don't we? Uh, spiritual leaders who led double lives and then eventually it all comes out and we're very shocked. So the question we could ask first off is, what were Hophni and Phineas guilty of? Well, they slept first of all with the women serving at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Not a good thing to do. And then they took more than their portion of the sacrifice from worshippers that they were also not entitled to do. And then if a worshipper refused, if he wouldn't give up his meat, what then happened was that they threatened that poor worshipper with violence. These men were just off the chart. They were godless men in spiritual positions. And so you could ask this, if God's temple or God's church is corrupt, what hope is there for mankind? What hope is there? Because darkness has essentially come and taken over where the bastion of light must be. What hope is left? But now, in our text, before we can really come to a point of despair, God lights a match for us, and He lights that match in verse 18. Because we read that there is a young man called Samuel who is ministering before the Lord. And he's actually doing what he's supposed to do. And so there's immediately a contrast between him and Hophni and Phinehas because Hophni and Phinehas are not doing what they're supposed to do. This young Samuel is a God-fearing young man and he's growing up in the presence of the Lord. And there is a lesson for us in this neck of the woods and that is that often we look to the world around us to our personal circumstances and even we look to the church and we become very discouraged because of all the darkness but we should know this that our God has and will always be working in ways we do not always comprehend understand or see to ensure that everything works to the good of those who are in Christ Jesus. God never, ever lets the light of his hope die out. It's from a light to a candle to a match to a candle to a light. But God's plan of redemption winds and twists through history, but it never goes out. And now in, in this neck of the woods, in this place, in our text, Samuel is now the light for Israel, the hope of Israel. And that by God's doing. As I said, Samuel is contrasted to Hophni and Phinehas. And we read again of these two errant men, Hophni and Phinehas, in verse 22. Um, I love the account. Their poor father, Eli, has heard about some of the bad things that his sons are doing. And so he speaks to them as a father should. And he says to them, Why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons. The report I hear spreading among the Lord's people is not good. If one person sins against another, God may mediate for the offender. But if anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? Now clearly, these words of Eli were very necessary. But these words of Eli are tragically too late. You can be too late. You can speak up when it's, it's past remedying. Because in this case... God has already judged Hophni and Phinehas. He's already judged them. Now, why do I say that? Because we read the following. Hophni and Phinehas did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. Do you see what's happened? Judgment has already been passed by God. Now some call this 
in the Bible the doctrine of judicial hardening. In other words, Hophni and Phineas can no longer repent, even if they want to, because God has stepped back and allowed them to continue on their path of sin, on their path of rebellion, on their path of hardness of heart. And so even if they wanted to, they would or would be unable to do so. Now we see instances of this all over in the Bible. For example, Pharaoh in Exodus, or you can look at Esau. Uh, and then there's the account of Esau in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 15 to 17. And uh, what the Bible records is the following. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up, causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that there be no sexually immoral or godless person like Esau, now listen to this, who sold his own birthright for a single meal, for you know that even afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. And so the doctrine of the judicial hardening of God is uh, something that we find in the Bible. And the question we could ask next is, does God still harden hearts today? It's an important question. My answer to that question is, yes, he still hardens hearts today. And I like the way one commentator put it, and I think he put it the best way possible, so I'm going to read to you what he said. He said this, But even more tangibly, the hardening of God is made manifest in two ways. In the continued rejection of the Messiah by ethnic Israel, Romans chapter 9 through 11, and in the celebration of sexual sin by Gentiles, and that's Romans chapter 1 verses 26 to 28. In both cases, broadly speaking, God's hardening is made visible to modern eyes. In other words, if you look around with your modern eyes, you will see God standing back and allowing people to continue on their rebellious path in their hardened heart state into a place where they cannot return. You may ask another important question, I think, which is a question we must answer, and that is whether God hardens the heart of a true believer who refuses to repent of sin. In other words, you're a Christian, you were truly born again and born of the Spirit, but you've entered into a space for sin and you're continuing with that sin. Is it then possible that God brings judgment upon you and you are hardened in your heart and continue in that path? Now, I personally don't think so. I don't think that God does that in relation to believers, but, there's a big but here, other theologians would disagree. And the arguments for and the arguments against are very convincing. And so what I think is either way, either way, we should all take serious warning to turn from our sin. We should be very, 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 very careful because the Bible puts these verses in. And in essence, they would, they would at their very least stand as a warning to us against sin. Sin destroys. It crouches at your door and its desire is to destroy you. When you get involved with sin, it entangles you, it suffocates you. Sometimes to repent from sin requires messy solutions. In other words, for example, you have an affair and then you break off the affair. But to fix it, uh, you have to uh, restore a whole lot of problems that you can't get fixed. You can't return on. Sometimes to repent from sin requires messy solutions. In Ezra, the covenant people, in order to repent, had to divorce their pagan wives and then send them back, together with their own children, to their pagan peoples. What a mess, I think, and, and how sad. But this is the reality, that sometimes to untangle yourself from sin, there's further damage. I like the way Carson comments on this. He says, some sins have such complex tentacles that it's not surprising if solutions undertaken by repentant sinners are messy as well. And that again is a warning to us that we should remember that sin has got tentacles. It's got ability to destroy our lives. Sin never has 
a positive outcome. Let's say that to each other. That sin never has a positive outcome. In verse 27, a man arrives at Shiloh bringing to Eli a message from God. And in this message, God asks, among other things, two questions of Eli. The first one is this. Why do you scorn my sacrifice and offering that I prescribed for my dwelling? Now it appears as if Eli had been unable to resist the temptation of the delightful food stolen by his sons. And uh, he, by doing that, by eating with them, he colluded with them, and therefore he was guilty of the very same sin as his sons. And what we learn from this is that if we mix with the husks, the pigs will eat us up. We are to separate ourselves from sin, even the sin of our loved ones, lest we be tempted. Sin is powerful. It is able to trip us up. So we avoid it. We don't stand against the line. We stand a few steps back from the line. The second question God put to Eli was this. Why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening yourselves on the choice parts of every offering made by my people Israel. You know, God is really asking more of the same question, but now the heart of the issue is clear. This was the real sin, that Eli had chosen the favor of his sons above God. He should have raised his sons differently. Boys, however cute they are when they're young, will one day become men. And Eli should have dealt with them sooner. He should have spoken to them sooner. Eli should have defrocked his sons later. He should have put God first. But he chose to put his sons first. He chose their acceptance above God's acceptance. And for this, Eli brings judgment upon his family. His sons will die together on the same day. That's among other things that will happen. And so we take that serious and we consider in our own lives whether we are choosing others above God and whether there is a duty on us to speak up in any specific situation and we best speak up now before it is possibly too late. Before we reach the point of no return. I close by summarizing, God's life has not left your darkness. Do not harden your heart, repent, do not underestimate sin and its power to destroy you and your family. Speak now to those who need speaking to before it's too late. And finally, please God, not people. Let us pray. Father, we ask your blessing upon our lives that we would be able to see your light in our lives. That you would help us, Lord, to soften our hearts towards you, to repent and to follow you, Lord Jesus. Help us, Father, to speak to those who need speaking to now before it's too late. And Lord, we ask that we wouldn't be seduced by the world and that we wouldn't seek the pleasures of it above you and that we wouldn't seek to please people and not you. We desire to please you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Bless us so we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.